I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. We are approaching Pluto on New Horizons, a baby grand size spacecraft filled with wonderful instruments that can image, that can use spectrometers to read the surface, can study the atmosphere, can study the plasma exchange. Uh, over these years, a detail, Alan has designated one, a part of his team, to identify new moons. So you know that it's not just Sharon around Pluto. You have Hydra and Nix, and you expect to find more. And we did find more. We found Styx and Kerberos as well. So right. there were four that we discovered. You also make it clear in this book, David, that Pluto is not a standalone planet. It's a binary planet with Sharon. Is that unique in our solar system? It is. The uh, size of Sharon compared to Pluto, I mean, they're both relatively small planets, but the, the, but the relative size, Sharon is huge for a moon in terms of relative size towards its primary planet. And that means the two of them orbit around a point in space that's in between them, uh, the common, what we call the barycenter. So they're really dancing around each other in, a, as a binary planet. It is a unique thing in our solar system. Uh, we come to waking up for the last time, because hibernate and New Horizons has been an out of hibernation. It comes to waking up the last time for New Horizons. And you wanted to be there, Alan. You get up very early in the morning for uh, the, not the wake up, but the sending of your core package to New Horizons. First, what, do a definition. What is the core package you're sending? Uh, this is early July, 2015. Yes, the core package is the, um, the set of instructions, basically a long computer program to instruct the spacecraft how to do the entire exploration of Pluto over a nine-day period called uh, uh, the core of the flyby. Uh, and it, it's a very long and involved and very heavily tested computer program uh, that was uh, being radioed up to the spacecraft and crossing the solar system at the speed of light. Four and a half hours to get there. Four and a half hours to make the same crossing at the speed of light that New Horizons took nine years right. to actually right. travel. Right. Uh, and then being ingested on board the spacecraft as the radio receiver was taking all of those commands in and putting them in the main and four computer. and a half hours back to you to confirm that it happened. That's right. And so then the, um, uh, the spacecraft is instructed to, to report how it did. The moment happens... You upload, uh, and it's on its way, and you're waiting for a confirmation that it's received the core package. You get it at about 1 p.m. in the afternoon, and then at 1.55, the world ends. You lose contact with the spacecraft. Bottom drops out. Um, nobody can believe it. You couldn't believe it. After all the near-death experiences, uh, this was some kind of cosmic joke. What had happened? Well, first of all, we had flown over 3,300 days without a significant problem. And here we were exactly 10 days before on the 4th of July, 10 days before our, our flyby. And we had an existential threat, we lost contact with the spacecraft. And when that happens, you can't even um, uh, send up uh, rescue commands. You can't even address the problem because you're not in contact. Right, right. And... Uh, uh, immediately, it was the July 4th holiday. People were mostly away with their families. We had a skeleton crew at Mission Control. Uh, the phones rang on everybody's cell phones, and people came pouring in from their picnics and their family affairs in flip-flops and in shorts and some in bathing suits. And we, we established the entire mission rescue team, the engineers, the flight controllers, the mission operations personnel, uh, myself as the project leader and Glenn Fountain as the project manager. Um, and we went into crisis mode because if we didn't rescue our baby, it was going to sail past Pluto in 10 days flat and not make any scientific observations. Within an hour, your theory that it had been overwhelmed and had gone into safe mode and would reignite itself was confirmed. So you had communication again, but there were problems. Yes. Well, when we came back in communications, of course, we learned from the uh, telemetry signals coming back that the spacecraft was not using its prime computer and prime guidance system, but it had switched over to the backups. And uh, in that process, lost the entire core load that we talked about and all the associated files that had been put up over a period of many months to instruct it through that flyby. So we had a, a number of problems on our hands. The first was that we were communicating at glacially slow 10 bit per second rates. The second was that we were on backup systems and we wanted to be on the prime system. And the third is, is that all those files that had been painstakingly placed on the spacecraft computers over months now had to be re-sent up and we had only three days to do it. 
we now have a scene that uh, assembled all the parts, except for the fact that it's a robot at the end of Apollo 13. It's a recreation of Apollo 13. You've got a tight window, and if you don't get there, not death, but failure, total failure. They don't have enough time, David. Yeah, and, and the thing is, at this point, because you're three billion miles from Earth, the speed of light seems so slow. I mean, we teach in science class how fast the speed yeah, of light right. is. You know, you can get to the moon in you know, uh, two seconds of round trip to the Apollo. But, but at that distance, it takes four and a half hours, which means nine hours round trip. So just to say to the spacecraft, hey, is everything okay? Are you there? And have it say, yeah, I'm fine. What should I do next? That's nine hours. And then... They looked at this when they, you know, they assembled this anomaly review board group, this sort of emergency team that's going to figure out what oh, to do. Nobody's leaving and the MOC. Nobody. No, they're nobody's sl- leaving. They're, they're sleeping on the floor. They're sending out for food. Nobody's and, and they're leaving. figuring out how many of these nine-hour right. round-trip time slots do we have. They had three. So first they get the spacecraft communicating at a normal speed, and then they start sending up you know, the, the files necessary to, uh, to execute the... Uh, the flyby, and they didn't have any time to spare. They couldn't do any of them wrong. So simultaneously on the ground, they're simulating all these new files on, you know, they have a, a replica, a, an electronic replica of the entire spacecraft, and they have to write the code and simulate it, make sure it's all working, and then send it up. If they did anything wrong during one of those nine-hour windows, the spacecraft would have, the encounter would have failed. And they, they ultimately, they got it on track with about three hours to spare. Uh, a detail here. Allen had brilliantly decided to build a second Backup, N-H-O-P-S. What is that? The New Horizons... Operations. Operations, simulator. thank you. Simulator. <laughs> the simulator, the OP, the, the New Horizons Operations Simulator. Yeah, and that's that's a detail er- earlier in the book. There are times when it seems like Alan's being, like, really, you know, maybe overly fastidious and, like, worrying about everything that could go wrong. We need to back up this. We need to rehearse this. and that. But there are all, all other times where it turns out that if he hadn't done that... It would have been toast. And this is one of those times because earlier in the mission, he had said, you know what? We shouldn't just have this one NHOPS, New Horizons Operations Simulator. We should have a backup simulator in case when we're planning the, uh, when we're planning the flyby, the simulator goes down, then we won't have time. So, so they had said, all right, all right, we'll build a backup. And then during this crisis, they didn't have time with just one NHOPS to test all the new software that they had to load up. They needed to have both of them running all the time. And if they hadn't had that backup simulator, they would not have gotten the spacecraft back on track in time to execute you the flyby. You make a decision out to tell Alice Bowman, your mom, M-O-M. Mm-hmm. Mission operations yes, manager. You, de- you make a decision to tell her, forget the icing, just the cake. What did you mean? Yeah. So at the, at the beginning of the crisis, mm-hmm. uh, when uh, Alice, who had uh, led mission operations for the entire decade-long um, voyage and who was in charge of the entire team uh, of flight controllers and so forth, um, at our first anomaly uh, review board meeting, she said, you know, the spacecraft is now idle. It's not making any of the scientific observations that it should be making today or tomorrow or the next day. And she said, now I've got a big problem on my hands. We've got to get off the backup systems and put all those files back up. Um, uh, How much of the observations that we're missing right now do you want to also accomplish? And immediately, I went through the calculus in my head and uh, instantly realized that the only thing that mattered was the close flyby. These observations made 10 days out were icing, not cake. They would be replaced by better observations later anyway. So I turned to Alice in the meeting and I said, you can trash all of it. Trash as much as you need to. Focus on what we need to actually accomplish. Let's get the spacecraft back online. Let's get the core load back up there and let's go have a flyby. They've calculated already that July 14th will be the closest flyby, but they're taking images all the way in, uh, images of the system, binary system, images, uh, and at some point you take an image that's better than Hubble, and you see it. What is your thought, Alan? Our first thought, uh, my first thought was we are, we are really there. Uh-huh. After all these years traveling in the wilderness, we are finally on Pluto's doorstep. Uh, you see... Uh, the images of Pluto getting larger. This is Laurie now. There are other instruments that are going to come in, but Laurie's my favorite because I can see Laurie. Um, you're, you're, you're achieving data that doesn't exist. You're at the front. You're beyond the frontier. You're over the edge. You're, you're in Star Trek now. You've gone at the edge of. You're at the edge of the galaxy, and you've gone out there into the multicolor lights of Star Trek. Uh, and 
you have no control really of the data because it's being uploaded and then comes to you slowly. As I understand, the space network is going to take a long time to download all of your information. It's, it's, it's part of the way that we did an inexpensive mission was we had a very low power transmitter and a very mm -hmm. small dish antenna on the spacecraft. So the bit rates are very low. But we have complete control over when the images come back to Earth and right. which ones we program that in. And you get the first image, and I want to mention uh, Laura Cantillo, who was my program director here before she went to NASA. And David wonderfully brings Laurie in at this moment for that first image. What does she see, David? I didn't know you used to work with Laurie. That's yeah. neat. Yeah, she's, she, she, she's wonderful, and she plays a wonderful part in this story because um, she's there in the room with Alan and other team members when these first images start to come in where you can start to really see the shapes of things on the surface, on the surface of Pluto. And there had been, we had known that there was this bright area. You could see that in Hubble, but it was this fuzzy blob. All we knew was one hemisphere had a bright spot. We didn't know anything about the shape or what it was. And then in this first image, you could really start to see the outline. And it was Laurie who said first, doesn't that look like a heart on Pluto? And then instantly, everybody started saying, well, yeah, it does look it, like it a heart. It does look like a heart. And it does. absolutely, Pluto has a heart. It's and that became close. part of the whole public perception of, you know, this beautiful planet with a heart. And Laurie was the first person who said that. And, so, and it's a heart the size of the state of Texas. It's a big heart, but I remember you on television at this moment. We were all watching Alan. And I, there was an anecdote, and I don't quote you correctly, pretty much like the team back there keeps saying, wow, every time they see a new image. Because n Pluto doesn't look like anything else. It doesn't even look like Pluto. It keeps changing. Yeah, absolutely. So th this is pure discovery. This is raw exploration. We were day by day, seeing things that no one had ever seen before. And Pluto was turning out to be as spectacular a planet as we had ever been to before. Uh, the spectacular part of Pluto, we're going to do very quickly here, just with uh, the moments that we have, because what I think is important is to identify the science, the science that's been achieved. Uh, so I want to go through a list that David and you provide at the end of the book, because we have these dramatic moments. The flyby is done. Pluto's on its way into the Kuiper Belt. It's got a new mission. I mean, New Horizons. It's got a new mission. But the, the mysteries of Pluto are in front of us. And this is our solar system. It's the only one we're ever going to have. And Pluto's an integral part of the mysteries. Uh, the first thing I'd like you both to comment on seems straightforward enough. The sheer complexity is the way you put it, David that Pluto is unlike anything else. How so? Well, you know, before we got there, we really had no idea what to expect. And it could have just been a cratered, battered ball, like some of the moons of, uh, of some of uh, the uh, giant planets. But it's the opposite end of the spectrum. It's so alive geologically. There's huge areas that are so young, they have zero impact craters. It's, it's got flow and motion. It's got other areas that are quite ancient. So, so just the variety, it's got everything from, you know, we, we, we have this expression, Pluto is the new Mars, because it's got, you know, it's got it all. It's got glaciers, it's got mountains, it's got ancient cratered areas. So that variety and complexity is just wonderful, and it really kind of surprised us and just gave us all these scientific mysteries to chew no, on. No, it's like an alien world at a Disney exhibit. You know, I like to call Pluto the sci-fi planet. The I mean, sci -fi imagine this. Yes. It is a planet with an apparently an ocean on the inside, past liquids that flow. A, a liquid ocean on the a inside. A liquid water ocean. Uh, it's got volcanoes the size of uh, the big ones in Hawaii. It's got all the things that David talked about, mountain ranges the size of the Rockies with snow caps on them, but made of methane. And it it's rains. It's a sci-fi world. It rains on Pluto. I have here a note, atmosphere cases up to 300 miles. Uh, when the sunlight hits the methane, it rains. It, it, it silts out. It doesn't liquid rain, but it's, it, you have sort of a snow taking Precipitates. place. Precipitates. <laughs> yeah. And that's the ruddiness of the poles? Uh, that's the ruddiness of the poles and also some other dark areas on the surface are caused by that, at least in part, by that rain. Uh, there is a feature, Sputnik Planitia. What is striking about that? Sputnik is this bright area that's the shape of a heart mm -hmm. that is made of condensed frozen nitrogen, uh, only a few degrees, a few tens of degrees above absolute zero. It is a massive glacier, the largest glacier in the solar system, the size of Texas and With Oklahoma no craters on it. combined. And it was born yesterday. It hasn't been out in the rain of cratering very long, so it doesn't have any pockmarks, meaning 
it was just created and or it's recreated. churning. Is it's there, churning. It's there, overturning like there, a pot on a stove. Is there anything else in the solar system like this? <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, there are analogies to some of the features we see. Earth has glaciers made out of water ice, just as Pluto has glaciers made out of nitrogen ice. But this huge plane of ice that is also sort of churning and convecting uh, and and is condensed out of the atmosphere in that way and playing that role that, that Sputnik plays on Pluto, we don't see anything like that anywhere else in the solar system. And Sharon and Pluto are binaries. But what I learned from you, Alan, is that that ruddiness that's on Pluto is also on Sharon, and you think they're exchanging... Well, that ruddiness on Sharon is at the North Pole. And one of the scientists on our team, Will Grundy, uh, another really brilliant guy, has figured out, and we published a, a, a couple of papers on this with the computer modeling that bears out Will's idea, which is that the red pole of Sharon is actually escaped atmospheric material from Pluto that has condensed on the coldest regions of Sharon at its poles. So these, these binaries are, are exchanging material, plasma Precisely. all the time. Right. Precisely. And, and neutral gas as well. Been, they've been doing this throughout their life. Probably for billions of years, the same way that binary stars do it. Uh, another another detail here that struck me as uh, just amazing is that the equatorial tectonic belt around the middle suggests that that ocean, the liquid water ocean, is ancient. It's been there a long time. Well, that the 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 extensional tectonic belt is on Sharon, oh, uh, not on Pluto. Sharon. Sorry, and not and on Sharon Pluto. had an ocean after it was formed when it was warm, but as the ocean cooled, you know what happens when ice cools and freezes? It expands, and it created that that more or less crack, which is the, the tectonic belt, the, the biggest canyon in the solar system, far larger than the Grand Canyon, 10 times longer, 10 times wider, much deeper, was caused by the freezing of Sharon's ancient ocean. The uh, success of New Horizons immediately suggests that we need an orbiter, immediately. I, I kept thinking, you know, I kept turning the page, okay, fine, fine. We have orbiter. We have an orbiter of Vespa, for heaven's sakes. Are we going to get an orbiter of Pluto with 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 these many mysteries? You know, um, we're never going to crack the nut without an orbiter, and there's right. a lot of interest in that in the scientific community. So we start again. We start again the process of uh, the ne- uh, making the case for the next mission to Pluto. Right. I can lower your rocket costs. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. David, is that going to change everything? What we're learning from commercial space, uh, Bezos and Musk and their competitors. Absolutely, because uh, there's so much more innovation now where there are more players launching payloads into orbit. The prices are coming down, uh, and it offloads some of what NASA... Uh, NASA doesn't have to be in, you know, sort of the, the, the trucking business anymore. NASA can focus on some of the things that NASA does really well uh, in deep space and with human space flight. And um, having more players in the game is always good. And yeah, I think it is a game changer, especially with reusable rockets. The price right. of getting something off of Earth is fundamentally decreasing, and that opens up all kinds of new possibilities. Uh, where is New Horizons right now? It's headed into the Kuiper Belt. You expect something to happen on New Year's Day 2019. What is that, Alan? That's right. Uh, New Horizons now, almost a billion miles farther than Pluto, is homing in on an ancient building block of small planets like Pluto, something... Uh, unlike anything this we have ever explored. This is 2014 MU69? Yes, 2014 MU69, a small Kuiper Belt object, also now nicknamed Ultima Thule, a Norse term that means beyond the farthest frontier. It's pretty apt for a nickname. Do we know what to expect? We don't. We're going exploring. The spacecraft is going to go even closer than it did to Pluto, return images and spectra, and uh, we have no idea. No one's in the, ever been to anything like this. All right, we've got uh, more than a year to go. Is Lori ready to take an image, or is it too far away? Well, uh, no, we're going to get spectacular images. Images so good that if we flew over New York City at the same altitude and Lori looked down, you would be counting the ponds in Central Park. And beyond, uh, beyond MU 2014 MU69, it's got a battery that will extend to 2030. At least to 2030, probably into the mid or late 2030s, and we're going to continue exploring. 
David Grinspoon, final question about New Horizons. Is NASA satisfied it did the right thing? Do they now boast about it? Oh, absolutely. Nobody at NASA w will uh, express any regrets about the, you know a successful mission like this. They boast about it, as they should. I mean, this is a NASA mission, and any uh, competition and recriminations are long in the past. And you could see that at the flyby. Uh, Larry Esposito, the competitor, fierce competitor for this mission many years ago, was at the flyby celebrating. NASA officials were there. I mean, once these things happen and succeed, the team all comes together and rightfully feels very proud of it. Chasing New Horizons, the mission to Pluto and beyond. Alan Stern, David Grinspoon. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.